So welcome everybody to uh, the next session, the paper session number 12. Um, I think we had already two very, very interesting day. I can promise you that this session on investment choices and investor behavior will um, will also be one of the, the uh, very, very interesting session, sessions today. So my name is uh, Alex Basson from University of Hamburg and the Sustainable Finance Research Group. And uh, we have, as in every session, three paper, and um, we have 20 minutes presentation, 10 minutes discussion. And as you know, you can post your questions in the chat and uh, we will answer, or the authors will answer your questions. Um, we changed the order a little bit. So we start with, uh, on the agenda, paper number two. Uh, Christian will present uh, the paper, Socially Responsible Investment Costs and Benefits for University Endowment Funds. And as this is something that is interesting for all of us, because we're all working at universities, I'm very much looking forward to Christian's uh, presentation. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, to everyone who came to the session. Um, so um, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, the question that we're posing here is, if you have an infinite horizon um, um, portfolio, such as the portfolio of a university endowment, should you specifically isolate RI responsible investments, that is, uh, considerations? And there's essentially two angles here. One angle is, well, if you're just maximizing um, uh, performance, then you're restricting your opportunity set, um, and then uh, that will result in a performance drag. The um, other uh, angle is perhaps if you view responsible investing as a cultural phenomenon, then the society will actually allocate resources towards those adopting responsible investing, towards those managers adopting responsible investing. And then so endowments may actually, and universities in general may benefit from that. Uh, remember that the endowment is um, set to help university achieve its goals. Uh, now, this thing, uh, viewing responsible investing actually as a, as a cultural uh, uh, phenomenon, um, uh, has the advantage that it won't say anything about whether it's good or bad for the entire world uh, to adopt responsible investing. It will tell you whether it's good or bad um, uh, for the university. And I want to say that universities actually embrace cultural shifts before. Um, so before the 1990s, if you look at uh, Ivy League schools in the United States, admission criteria were based on socioeconomic class. And then in the 1900s, the universities actually, slightly before that, the universities actually decided to change to a merit-based admission system. And exactly like the conversation goes with responsible investing, many people worry that, well, this will destroy the universities because the universities will lose essentially the wealthy people that uh, sustain them financially. And uh, obviously this hasn't happened. So the move to the society in, in its entirety from a uh, class-based system, if you want, to a uh, merit-based system, when that was embraced by the universities, universities actually benefited from that. So, so we're looking to see whether there's uh, benefits to the university uh, and the endowment uh, by embracing responsible investing. Now, at least we've heard about uh, a pressure uh, towards university endowments to follow uh, more uh, responsible practices in the investment process. There's stakeholders pressure, so students petition for divestment, faculty petition for divestment. Um, um, if the university or the endowment does not um, adopt responsible investing practices, um, <clears throat> then uh, donations uh, threaten to stop. Um, uh, there's cases in which if, if the university is adopting responsible investment practices, then the, the donations then in, in that case uh, will stop. So a priori, we don't know whether it's good for donations if the university follows responsible investing practices or not. Uh, and then there's some evidence that the students 
uh, which are some of the stakeholders pushing for divestment, there's evidence that students actually like responsible investing. So universities who follow those practices uh, may attract more students in principle. Um, so the question is, does society value responsible investing? What are the trade-offs of implementing responsible investing for investments for universities? In particular, do capital flow support RI and does RI bring any other benefits? Um, the university endowments are a good micro world to study these questions uh, uh, before, because um, again, RI imposes constraints on portfolio management, just like it happens in real world. Um, performance is important, obviously, for funding university activities. So the universities will not simply throw performance away entirely to impose constraints on their portfolios. Um, they have to listen to their stakeholders. So it's not the management of a portfolio in isolation is basically also listening to your students and to your faculty. Uh, uh, also to your donors and um, uh, other uh, uh, employees. Um, so um, uh, then uh, universities experience cultural shifts before. So if I want to see whether adopting responsible investing is good or bad, uh, may maybe for an entity, the university is an entity actually that's um, uh, housed in a fairly large equilibrium model uh, rather than being just a single uh, uh, investment fund. Uh, and then again, universities have very long investment horizons. And then if you're looking at the investment horizons of uh, essentially environmental problems, these horizons are also very long, typically longer than even the investment horizon actually of, uh, let's say, a retirement fund. Um, what do uh, we uh, contribute uh, uh, with? Well, we study essentially RI in the context of a long uh, horizon. We're looking at the relationship between RI and performance for university endowments. We're looking at other consequences actually of uh, RI. We can sum up essentially the consequences of RI uh, uh, in terms of asset growth for the endowment. So returns respond to RI, donations respond to RI, and let's say, even if the returns decline, donations actually may go up. So, so it's a positive uh, thing actually to adopt RI. Or they may, it may be that they all go up or that they all go down. And then we're looking at other non-pecuniary benefits actually from adopting responsible investments that can be quantified at university level. Um, here's essentially what we will be um, finding, uh, what we found. So first, more endowments is not actually shocking. More endowments are pursuing responsible investments from 30% in the beginning of our sample to 46% actually in 2017. Our sample is about, um, uh, starts in 2009. Uh, RI is more likely when there's more social pressure from the stakeholders on universities. Uh, it's more likely when universities are located near firms that are more devoted to corporate social responsibility. So that goes with the fact that adopting RI is a cultural phenomenon that finally makes its way to investing. And uh, RI is also more likely when the university budget is more reliant on donations. Um, so if the university needs to truly cater to its donors, as these donors embrace RI themselves, the university has to embrace RI as well. Uh, and RI attracts more donations. Um, again, this is not necessarily surprising. So if there's a culture essentially sweeping the world in which everybody likes RI more, then the donors like the fact that the endowment is pursuing RI and then they respond with capital flows. Uh, and we also find that adopting RI is not idle talk. Actually, endowments do something and change something in their portfolios. We also find that adopting RI is costly. So there's higher management fees, um, higher portfolio uh, volatility. We find that RI is weakly, but positively related to performance. Uh, but this is due to the fact that endowments adopting RI decreased oil and vice exposures, and then these asset classes have done poorly during our sample. If you correct for that, RI is then negatively related to performance. 
months. Um, we find that RI is actually positively related to endowment growth, although this is a very weak relationship after all. Um, um, and, um, and then actually, if you remove the oil and vice exposures, basically you find no relationship and then even a negative coefficient between RI and endowment uh, uh, growth. Endowment growth means returns plus donations. Um, we find that there's other non-pecuniary benefits brought uh, about by adopting RI by the endowment. So we find that risk management practices are improved. So endowments do more in terms of risk management. We find that faculty feel inspired and ask and receive more grants, especially grants to study sustainability. We find that universities uh, receive more student applications. And we were again looking at since there's no re the, the relationship between adopting RI and endowment growth is very weak, let's say no relationship there, um, you're wondering if the endowment adopts RI, perhaps the endowment feels the need to pay a little less money to the university every year. And then we find actually by contrast that, that payouts from the endowment to the university actually go up. So charity does not decline. The data that we're using is essentially a survey of about a thousand university endowments between 2019 and 2017. There is a professional association of endowment, uh, essentially managers and business officers of universities. It's called NACUBO. Um, this organization sends a survey every year. Uh, there's about 300 questions in the survey. So quite fascinating for the, to understand essentially what uh, university endowments are doing. And in 2009, they started to ask questions about social responsibility. Um, and we use essentially this data for, uh, for our study. Uh, we merged that with uh, large donation data uh, that, is, that uh, are published by the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Uh, and then of course we need returns of oil and, and then vice um, um, indices. We use the database that uh, tracks university data called iPads, Integrated Post-Secondary Education System. And then we use MSCI ESG scores to calculate essentially the level of um, uh, cultural social responsibility, uh, corporate social responsibility actually in a state as the average of the firms actually uh, housed in, the, in that state. Um, this is sort of a page from the survey, I guess, if you're curious. And then our key variable is essentially is our, an RI, a responsible investing actually indicator. It's used to measure an endowment standing concerning, social, uh, concerning responsible investments. So if essentially if the endowment basically says that they're doing anything in terms of social responsibility, of responsibility including just thinking about it, then this uh, indicator variable is actually equal to one. Uh, we have a section in which we do robustness checks in which we separate actually this responsible investing variable by whether the endowment cares about E, S, or G, whether the endowment wants to divest, whether the endowment actually does impact investing, which is allocate a slice of the endowment to particular um, uh, uh, green, let's say, or environmentally friendly strategies. Um, and, and then we find that all of our results basically hold in exactly the same way uh, if we use that variable. Uh, changes in, uh, in, social, in responsible investing, uh, we see that more endowments adopted, and this is correlated essentially with divestment announcements that we collect from the news. So our variable, even though it's focused on what, it, what is the endowment saying they're doing about responsibility, it seems that it's correlated at least with what you see in the news about endowments. Um, as I said, in, uh, RI is increasing in popularity. Uh, this is a heat map um, of uh, how much it's adopted, especially in the states actually where this is more socially responsible. You see it's correlated essentially with the culture of the place. Um, what determines RI? As I was saying before, RI is more prevalent where more stakeholders sort of the university. So faculty, donors, students will actually go out and then ask the endowment to divest. So when the endowment interacts with more of these stakeholders, then, then you see a higher likelihood of the university to pursue responsible investing. Um, you see that uh, if the university is located in states where companies are uh, uh, having high CSR, corporate social responsibility scores, then it's more likely that the university follows suit. Uh, if the university has a religious affiliation, of course, that 
imposes constraints on the endowment. So the endowment is more likely to become responsible in its investing. Um, and then when the university budget is more reliant on donation, then, then also the university endowment is more likely to follow um, responsible investing practices. What is the relationship between RI and donations? Well, this, without doubt, the more um, the, um, if the university adopts um, uh, RI practices, then, they, then, then the endowment actually sees more in terms of donations. So we do that in terms of a regression. We do that in terms of a uh, um, <coughs> event uh, star, dif difference in differences uh, uh, test. And uh, this is stronger if the donor lives actually uh, uh, also in a high CSR uh, uh, region. And then we also find it actually that it's stronger if the donor basically makes the money for other industries other than let's say uh, uh, oil. Um, we appreciate basically about a cumulative increase actually about of about 6%, I guess, once the endowment uh, in, in the uh, four years basically following the adoption um, uh, in the case where the endowment basically uh, adopts responsible investing practices. Now, the question is, so donations go up, do endowments do anything in terms of um, uh, changing their portfolio? So what we're doing is essentially looking at whether exposures to oil uh, or vice, we're looking at whether these uh, things change uh, depending on whether the endowment adopted social response, uh, adopted responsible investing practices or not. And then we find that they do. So oil exposures and vice exposures both decrease. Um, we find that asset allocation weights also change. So if we're looking at cosine similarity between asset allocation after adopting as RI and before, we find that endowments that adopt RI basically do change the asset allocation weights. Um, is this costly? What well, we find that it is. So total costs of managing the endowment increase, especially management fees increase. Uh, which is not really surprising, I guess, if you think about um, how some of these endowments actually adopt uh, RI investment practices, for example, by going into a mutual fund that does that. And then these funds actually tend to maybe have slightly larger fees. Um, what about responsible investing and performance for endowments? We do find that volatility increases once RI practices are approved. We find that endowments that adopted these practices outperform, but again, if you take exposures to oil and to vice out, then we find basically that, they, that there's a performance drag. Is this timing um, of oil and vice intentional? It's unclear, but um, if you correct for it, then the, the, that performance differential basically goes away. Uh, we do find other benefits of RI adoption beyond just endowment growth. By the way, if you look at endowment growth overall, the endowment growth essentially is about zero. So performance, you see a drag after you correct for oil exposures, donations, they increase. When you add these two things up, essentially you get about zero. Um, so is it good to do RI? Well, the university sees other benefits for that. So um, the number of student applications to the university increase, especially for universities having small endowments. So they send a very good positive signal to their students by adopting RI practices. And then we also see that uh, faculty at these universities get more funding, especially funding to study sustainability. Um, and um, we also find that endowments basically change their risk management practices. They're tracking more statistics, I guess, once they've uh, started to implement RI. So perhaps the management of, of, of this type of endowments becomes a little bit uh, more challenging. Um, as I was saying, faculty research basically goes up in terms of sustainability awards. Um, applications go up, especially at smaller universities. And the endowment actually does not become less generous. So the endowment continues to pay um, the university generously. Christian, the 20 minutes are over. Maybe you can just uh, come briefly to an end if that's possible. Uh, very good, yeah. 
Sure, sure. So robustness, basically, as I was saying, robustness checks work if I change the definition of RI to make it a little bit more precise. Our own endowment essentially bought these results. So we divested out of fossil fuels from our public portfolio, and then we're actually trying to do the same on our private portfolio. Um, and the conclusion is that this seems to be a cultural change whose adoption actually benefits uh, uh, universities in general. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Very, very, very interesting topic and uh, also very interesting findings. Um, as so far, I can't see any questions in the chat. Um, so maybe I can just start with uh, with one question I had. Um, you said that um, I, have, I have a lot of questions. I will start with the first one. You said um, if responsible investment is going up, um, the also the endowments are uh, going up, if I understood it correctly. And I was just wondering if you could also see if there is a change in the fund, the funding, so where the money is coming from. So especially in those sectors, you, you had um, oil and, uh, and vice funds. So especially if they had a very high exposure uh, to oil companies, um, do, do you also see something we see in, in traditional investment, the, the momentum strategy that there is a change if they move from oil um, of the divest from oil that they, they are able to create a new funding base for universities? So there are cases in which a university said, we will divest out of particular public investments from oil, and um, which for endowments actually means absolutely nothing because they don't hold any direct public investments typically, it's all done through mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. um, but once that announcement was made that impacted the portfolio in no way, then you saw that some donors coming from that industry actually withdrew money from the university. So this is the mm -hmm. example of Syracuse University, I think, in the US. Um, you also see that when the endowments adopted uh, responsible investment practices, donations increased. And then if you're looking at the source of money for the donor, the source of money came was from outside of the oil industry. So it's not oil magnates that feel bad about um, doing damage to the environment and giving money to the university to feel better. It's the people that are or have done socially, I mean, responsible things that donate more money once the endowment switches to social, to uh, more, to being more responsible. Um, in, in terms of how the university is getting money, we find that grants to the university increase. The, the endowment does not see grants other than basically by perhaps taxing, uh, but, but the typical endowment gets money from donations only mm -hmm. uh, or potentially lawsuits that the university has, I, I guess, against particular industries. Right. That's really, really interesting to see that. So, so that is also a way of steering like, like your, your community as a university. Um, I, have, I have another question. Um, so, and, and the other participants, if you have any questions, just use the chat. Or those who are presenting later, they can also just uh, just uh, jump in and ask uh, questions if they want to. Um, the second question I have is uh, is on the the one thing you briefly mentioned that the asset allocation change. Um, do you know? Could you see what kind of change that is? Because I think that's quite interesting to see that there is. Um, if you move as a university to, to RI, that there is also a change in the asset allocation. Well, I mean, one very quick, basically, thing that the university is actually maybe doing is, is shifting their allocations towards more private assets. So, so one type of uh, RI procedure that is easy to follow is to take the oil or uh, coal exposures out from the public slice of your portfolio. So the public mm -hmm. slice of the portfolio is about half of the portfolio of the endowments. So if you want to do that, then, then you may substitute essentially with more private assets. And that could be good or bad. It, it could be bad in the sense that you could invest more in energy partnerships. So you didn't in reality decrease your oil exposures. We find that oil exposures do decrease. But mm -hmm. at least as endowments start adopting RI procedures, I guess something changes in the public portfolio. Maybe they substitute that by going into private assets of other sorts. All right, thank you. And Stefano, you also have a question. Yes, um, quick one. Thank you. I found the paper very, very interesting. 
And uh, I was thinking, obviously, the decision of university endowments to adopt, uh, adopt uh, a responsive investment strategy is somehow it can be endogenous to uh, the possible availability of donation. And I think it's perfectly fine. I mean, uh, your paper is, remains super interesting, but just an idea for having also uh, an exogenous shock. Uh, so you may exploit the election of Trump that somehow created a, a polarization of uh, uh, of uh, views on uh, oil and climate issue uh, as a way to, I mean, you may want to see an increase uh, of the effect of uh, responsible investment practices on donation after these events, especially because your explanation is cultural based. So this is a shock, uh, is a really a cultural shock and so a political one, but. Uh... Yeah, the, my, a very interesting suggestion. So our sample stops in 2017. I see. Um, and uh, the, so the organizations that run this survey change. So it's the professional organization of college and university business officers, along with, it used to be Cambridge, it used to be Associates, it used to be, um, uh, now it's TIAA. And um, there is a bit of difficulty actually in obtaining this data from TIAA. The reason is TIAA wanted to go into the endowment business itself. Yeah. And now they decided actually that they don't want to. So th they have essentially no interest or very clear interest in endowments, but they uh, still run the survey because the contract is to run the survey for, I think, three more years. <laughs> I see. No, no, I, I understand this. Just for your information, I know that the donation to environmental NGOs in the US, for instance, right after the election of Donald Trump, really soared, uh, uh, oh. uh, went up significantly oh. as, a, as a cultural backlash to the election of Donald Trump. So somehow this is very uh, related to what you're doing. It's certainly a great suggestion. Great data. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stefano. Um, maybe last uh, final question. Um, you said that also the, the type of investors is changing more social aspect. Is it social covering also environment or could you separate between social and environment? Also, if you look at the um, SRI investments you do have, is it possible to distinguish between social and environment? Yes, so, so we're using just responsible investing as anything that has to do with increasing the responsibility, whether that's toward the environmental causes, social causes. Um, um, but we do have, uh, and then the, this survey essentially started to separate the E, the S, and the G. Um, and, and then we do have a section of the paper in which we're building the variable basically based on what is it that endowments are doing in terms of each one of these things. And then we add them up. So if they're doing something in terms of E, S, and G, then the score is three. Otherwise it's one. And then mm -hmm. the results actually hold. So now it's possible actually to separate. All right, that's cool. Okay. Christian, thanks a lot um, for your for your presentation and also for for the uh, discussion. Quite interesting, and I still think a very important topic to see is it really um, walk the talk. Uh, the one headline you you had, and we can say that universities are doing that. And it was very good that you also picked the example of your university that you are doing that as well. It's always good to believe the things we are doing. Thank okay. You very much. Thank you. So um, we are continuing now with um, the uh, second paper that will be Stefano. You already know now from his questions, uh, green sentiment, stock returns and corporate uh, behavior. Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, opa. Okay, I assume you can all see my, my slides. So first of all, thanks a lot for having me on the program and thanks to the organizer for, for the great conference. So I'm gonna present you this new paper with my co-author Marie, Marie, Marie Briere. And this is, a, as I said, a new paper. So uh, thanks in advance for any comments and suggestions you may have. So first, a little bit of motivation, what, what we are trying to do here. So as you know, environmental consideration are uh, gaining an, in, an increasing important, increasing importance in, uh, in financial markets. And there's been a quite a long-standing debate on the performance, uh, so auto performance or underperformance of uh, ESG uh, factors. And uh, somehow we jump on uh, this debate and we, we think that the possible overperformance of green stocks in the last 10, 15 years is likely driven by two different, uh, two related but very different 
drivers. On the one hand, we have an increase in uh, awareness of uh, climate risk or also actual uh, climate risk due, for instance, to the adoption of uh, the Paris, uh, the Paris um, Agreement. And this is a sort of a source of fundamental uh, demand for green assets. Uh, so in other words, this is uh, an increase in demand for environmental responsibility driven by cash flow and risk considerations. Another factor that may have driven the uh, return of, uh, of uh, green, uh, green stocks is a higher willingness to pay for environmental responsibility. And this is a non-fundamental demand for uh, green assets, uh, or um, as we call it, green sentiment. Okay, so both these uh, factors, by uh, increasing the demand for green stocks, may have led to an auto performance of uh, uh, green, uh, green, uh, green stocks. But for very different uh, reasons, very different drivers. And the, the challenge, empirical challenge that we, we face in this, uh, in this work is how to disentangle these two components and to study their uh, separated effect on financial markets. And we believe that this uh, challenge is very important also from a policy perspective, because obviously uh, both investors and regulators, now also central banks, need to know exactly what is driving uh, the, the value and, and the performance of green firms. Is that uh, fundamental news or non-fundamental news? This is very important to, uh, to understand. So uh, we ask three main uh, questions and we have three key results. First, we ask how can we proxy investor non-fundamental de green demand? And here we propose a, a new method to estimate shift in non-fundamental green demand, so green sentiment, based of, on abnormal inflows into green exchange traded funds. So, and I'll tell you uh, in a moment why we believe this approach is appropriate. And the second question is, what is the impact of this green sentiment on asset prices? Does, uh, does it lead to an auto performance of green stocks or not? And we show that indeed, higher green sentiment is associated with an outperformance performance of firms with a greater environmental responsibility, as you will see as we proxy by uh, the environmental score. Finally, uh, we believe that it's also important to study the impact of green sentiment, not only on uh, uh, stock prices, but also on firms' real decisions. And we find that higher green sentiment is associated with higher capital investment if cash accumulation by more environmentally responsible firms, especially those that are more equity, de equi equity dependent, as theory uh, suggests. So uh, let me now guide you through these three elements of our paper, starting from the methodological contributions, how we identify green sentiment from ETF arbitrage activity. So we argue that ETFs offer a unique setting to identify non-fundamental demand. So as you may know, ETF are basically uh, close, closer than uh, mutual funds that are traded on uh, the stock market. So they have a, pr a price on their own. And this price is usually very similar to the value of the underlying assets, so the basket of securities in the uh, ETF. So obviously they are the same, uh, uh, the same product in the end, so they should have a very, very similar price. However, sometimes the price of ETF differs from the, the value of the underlying assets. And this is mostly due to the fact that ETF cater to different uh, investors. So they have a different uh, ownership, structure, ownership structure than the underlying stocks. Most notably, ETF are more used by retail investors and short-term uh, in institutional investors, speculative investors. So sometimes we have a violation of the law of one price between the ETF and uh, the underlying assets. And this reveals non-fundamental demand, right? Because ETF demand is more subject to sentiment, as the literature suggests. This mispricing between the ETF and the line assets basically give rise to observable ETF flows that can be uh, inflows, so creation of new ETF shares, or outflows, so the redemption of ETF shares. Okay, and this mechanism, so the fact that ETF can be used to proxy non-fundamental demand is, or, or, I mean, now, now, now already well established in the literature. So there are a very important paper on this topic. So what we do as a contribution in this paper is to use the abnormal flows into green ETF, so ETF 
with explicit environmental characteristics as a proxy for a market-wide changes in uh, green sentiment. Okay, well, if you, uh, if you have any question or doubt on, uh, on this approach, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. So in practice, what we do is we estimate a regression of monthly flows uh, uh, in uh, ETF on, on a series of uh, fund characteristics, in, including a dummy that is equal to one for green funds and zero otherwise. So we capture, we store these uh, coefficient for every month and the time series of this estimated coefficient is what we, we call green sentiment, okay? It's important to stress that this approach, this regression is, in, uh, is important to control for these massive inflows uh, that, that we experienced in the last 10 years from mutual funds to ETF in general. So we are not interested in this uh, shift to ETF in general. What we are interested in is the uh, abnormal flows into green ETF. And uh, so we start from a sample of all uh, US equity and a diversified ETF uh, over the period 2010, 2020. So we have a relatively uh, short sample period and we identify 23 ETFs that are clearly uh, environmental friendly. So, so we have, for instance, I share global clean energy ETF, Invesco Scholar ETF and so on and so forth. So in here, I'm plotting basically the results of this uh, computation that we, we perform through this regression. And the green line here is our green sentiment uh, index. And we are comparing it to two popular indexes in the literature. The first one is the negative climate news index used by uh, Engel et al in their uh, RFS uh, paper, uh, which supposedly reflect fundamental news. So uh, climate risk, news about climate risk. So fundamental uh, news about uh, climate change. The second index is the Google uh, search value index for climate change in the US. So in what we observe that our green sentiment index correlates negatively with the, uh, the uh, climate risk uh, measure by Engel et al. So with uh, fundamental demand for green assets and it correlates positively with uh, the public attention to, to cl climate change. So these simple descriptive statistics are meant to convince you that our index is actually capturing uh, no, the no fundamental uh, uh, part of green demand, okay? And that is very different from uh, the index based on uh, news that are used in the literature. So what we, we want to do, we, we do next is to use this uh, index that uh, is in our opinion quite unique because it's based on uh, green sentiment, so it's capture uh, green sentiment to study the effect on stock returns and in particular on the pricing of uh, the E component of the ESG score. So the environmental responsibility of firms. And we collect a series of uh, standard uh, uh, firm and stock characteristics and uh, um, and in particular as i said before our key variable of interest is the environmental score and we use the environmental score from sustainalytics even though we have a robustness check with uh, uh, the also the msci measure so, and here is one of our key results so here we regress a monthly return of uh, us uh, stocks on a series of uh, firm and stock uh, characteristics and our main coefficient of interest is the coefficient on the interaction term between green sentiment and the environmental score so what we expect is that when there is a higher green sentiment uh, the environmental score is priced more by by financial market and this is exactly what we observe uh, specifically an increase in one standard deviation of green sentiment in t is followed by a roughly 29 basis point higher return for more responsible stocks in T plus one. And this effect is amplified in following months through T plus six, where uh, um, more responsible firms earn an extra 60 basis point. And these uh, results is robust to various specifications. So here I'm not controlling for time fixed effect, but uh, controlling for month fixed effect doesn't affect uh, our results. And also class, level class and standard errors uh, doesn't affect uh, this key uh, conclusion. And here I'm just illustrating 
uh, these results. So here you can see that the, the effect of green sentiment on the pricing of environmental responsibility does not revert, not even after 12 months. And this is an interesting result because, you know, usually in the literature on sentiment, we have a reversal after a few months. So, I mean, we expect the effect of sentiment to reverse uh, after one of two, two, two months, but here it seems pretty uh, persistent over time, at least uh, so far, at least in the 10 years we, we have been uh, looking at. Uh, so very briefly here, we replicate the results, also accounting for the potential effect of uh, fundamental news. So here uh, we also add an interaction between negative uh, climate news index, the one used by Engel et al with uh, um, the environmental score. And we find two results. First, even by accounting for these fundamental uh, uh, climate news, so climate risk, the effect of green sentiment seems to persist. And obviously we find that a news-based climate risk predicts green return to, and this is exactly the results in Angola et al. So, but the, the main message of this analysis is that green sentiment and climate risk both impact stock prices and also in a similar way, I would add, but through very different channels. So one is uh, somehow, uh, uh, the effect is driven by the pricing of uh, climate risk, higher awareness of climate risk, and on the other hand, we have a, a, um, an auto performance driven by a green sentiment. So if you want a green preferences or speculative method, so speculative uh, reasons. And uh, here very briefly, um, so as one may expect, we confirm that green sentiment does not explain uh, earning forecast uh, revision. So despite having an effect on stock prices, so this confirms that we are capturing something that is not fundamental. So it's not related to changing firms' uh, cash flows expectations, uh, while the climate risk uh, measure using the literature is indeed associated with uh, a revision in earning forecast. So it's capturing fundamental uh, information. And here again, here I'll go very briefly for, in, for the sake of time, but we show that the, our, uh, this effect is not driven by uh, the, pr the direct price pressure of uh, ETF. So uh, a mechanism that was suggested by Franzoni et al. But it's rather the effect of a market-wide change in appetite for green, uh, for green, uh, from greenness for environmental responsibility. Okay, let me jump to uh, the third part of, uh, of, uh, of the paper. And here we look at the effect of green sentiment on corporate behavior. So why we, we are doing that? Because obviously uh, all the theory about social responsible investing suggests that green preferences, so and ultimately uh, the social responsible uh, movement can influence, uh, I mean, can make the world a better place by influencing the firm's cost of capital. And uh, in particular, by depressing the value of uh, brown firms, uh, investor uh, should make uh, investment by these firms uh, less profitable and therefore uh, favor greener firms, okay? But these channels is very rarely uh, explored in empirical works, uh, most focus only on, on asset prices. And, uh, that's what we, we do here. So here we bring the analysis from the, from the monthly level to the quarterly level, because we have accounting data on a quarterly uh, basis. And we regress uh, capital investments or cash, uh, cash, uh, cash holdings on a series of firm characteristics and an interaction terms between the average green sentiment in a given quarter and again, the environmental score. And what we observe is that a one standard deviation uh, increase in green sentiment in a given quarter is associated with an increase of 0.26% uh, in capital investment by more environmental responsible firms and 0.27% uh, higher cash holdings by the same firms. So uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in short, green firms in period of high green sentiment can make uh, higher investments and they can also accumulate more cash for precautionary reasons, for instance. So we find that this is uh, an, interesting, an interesting finding. 
obviously this uh, effect on real corporate decision doesn't appear to be homogeneous among, among firms. In fact, the theory suggests, in particular the paper by Baker et al, QJE, suggests that uh, sentiment should matter more for firms that are very much equity dependent. So in particular, for firms that cannot raise capital easily uh, through other channels, for instance, the, the debt market. And so we uh, conduct a, um, a, um, an, a cross-sectional heterogeneity analysis where we split the sample in low, medium, and high credit ratings firms. High credit ratings firms uh, usually are better firms and they can raise uh, funds very cheaply also on the debt market, for instance or uh, through banks. And we observe that the effect of green sentiment on capital investment seems to be driven mostly by low and medium uh, credit ratings firms, so firms that are very much uh, equity dependent, so they may wait for green sentiment to, um, to like approve their investment decisions, while the effect of, uh, on cash holdings is mostly driven by firms with low credit ratings, so presumably firms that uh, are equity dependent and they uh, don't feel like making investments, rather they uh, accumulate uh, cash. So I'm already at, uh, at the concluding remarks, I think I'm on time, if not early. So with this paper, we uh, aim at proposing a new method to measure green sentiment. Uh, so a green sentiment is a new type of uh, investor sentiment among the many that we already have. And through, to, to do that, we exploit uh, a method uh, based on the estimation of non-fundamental demand shocks based on exchange traded funds with green characteristics. And we show that changes in green sentiment predict a long lasting stock price of performance of uh, uh, green stocks, so stocks with uh, better environmental scores. And this uh, effect is similar in magnitude to the effect of uh, uh, fundamental uh, news, or, uh, so climate risk. Uh, so in what, the key message here is that the pricing of environmental responsibility may be driven both by fundamental and non-fundamental news. And green sentiment seems also to have an effect on real corporate decisions. In particular, allow uh, greener firms to increase their capital investment and cash holdings. Okay, so uh, obviously uh, here I would like to stress that these results hold in the, in the sample period we analyzed that is relatively short, 2010 and 2020 to 2020. A key question is what will happen in the next uh, 10 years, because it may be that this green, uh, the defect of green sentiment on uh, stock returns will continue to hold and be persistent, while it's also possible that at some point we have a little bit of uh, reversal. This is, a, uh, is a still an open, an open question. Thank you. And I look forward to, to your questions and remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Um, again, a very nice uh, piece of work you, you presented here. Also, the approach this is something I really liked, saying, well, we look at the uh, non-fundamental demand uh, using ETS for that. Um, there is no question in the chat so far, so if anyone has a question, just post uh, post in the chat, please. And also for the other presenters, you can just jump in. Uh, I have I have um, at least two questions. Um, I would like to start with the uh, first one, which was just at the beginning, where you said, well, the ownership structure of ETF and uh, the underlying is different. Uh, you said it's more retail and short-term investors. Um, can you say something about the, the potential effect of the different ownership structure on your findings? Um, that's, uh, yeah, you mentioned that here. Exactly. Uh, can you yes, say anything? That's a, that's, a, that's, a critical, that's a critical point, in fact. So all our method is based on this different ownership structure of uh, ETF, between ETF and the underlying stocks. So in the US, around 80% of individual stocks are held by institutional investors. Okay, while uh, this is only, I mean, this, this percentage of ownership is below 50 for, uh, for ETF. So ETF uh, are more sensitive to demand by retail investors, for instance. And also the literature show that are more used by short-term institutional investors. For instance, investors that need to uh, take a short-term speculative position on a, on a given uh, team or asset class. Okay, so 
the key message uh, in the limited literature so far on ETF is that ETF flows can be a signal of sentiment. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, sentiment for, um, I mean, for uh, in general, so for, for equity uh, in, uh, in general, for risk, uh, sentiment for uh, uh, some speculative products. So for instance, there are ETFs that are, they are called leverage ETF, and uh, that are, and are, I mean, the ETF that allow to take a lot of uh, leverage on the, the equity market. And the, pap uh, the paper by Davis, I told here that I'm, Davis that I'm citing here on the Q QFA, uh, exactly look at uh, its title, a speculative sentiment and adopt a similar strategy to the one we adopt here to estimate speculative sentiment. Okay, so abnormal demand for these uh, speculative products. And uh, uh, exactly. So, but the difference, uh, the difference in ownership between ETF and the underlying stocks is critical for our methodology. But and uh, and also very, it's also very interesting. And uh, I, I, I think because the, yeah. again, uh, ETF and the underlying assets are basically the same animals. They are the same things, but they are used by different people, different types of investors. One can exploit that. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thank you. I think this makes it makes it really excellent uh, piece to to analyze um, that they they um, they are so close, but exactly differences you design. So, we've one question in the chat, um, which is linked to very similar to what we just said. I'll just read it for everyone. How exactly. about you identify the non fundamental demand um, using flows into sustainable mutual funds rather than using green ETFs? Exactly. This is a, another excellent question. So I have some works on uh, uh, mutual funds, especially I have a paper titled low carbon mutual funds. So looking at flows into low carbon mutual funds or green mutual funds does not allow to distinguish between fundamental and non-fundamental demand. So it's impossible to tell if investors put money in these funds because they expect uh, uh, firms in these funds to, to do well in the future or simply because they increase their taste for greenness. So this is impossible to tell. I mean, unless we enter, we can enter the mind of uh, these investors or we can, we have a very long sample period and we can study how these funds perform uh, in the long term, uh, which in any case, uh, that would be a, a dirty proxy of what investors thought in the first place. So mutual funds do not allow to distinguish uh, between fundamental and non-fundamental demand because they uh, they are open-end funds. So if you want to invest in that fund, you can you can invest and you observe uh, flows, uh, but that doesn't say anything about whether that was fundamental or non-fundamental. But for ETF, that's different because when we observe inflows in ETF, it means that some shares were created because they are closed, uh, closed and mutual funds. And for share to be created, we need a mismatch. So a violation of the lower one price between the price of the ETF and the price on the underlying the securities. So uh, exactly. So the, our method fits well with ETF and not with mutual funds. That's, I uh, hope I answer questions. All right, thank you. Um, I have uh, another question, um, but this is more like if I understood it correctly. It was on slide, I think slide 18. Maybe you can go to slide 18 there where you had the interaction term, which was um, significant, but if- Sorry, I'm, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, 18, I think. Um, yes, that one. Well, we do see that um, the interaction term of green sentiment environment score for CapEx and cash is, uh, positive and highly significant uh, for the environmental score and for the green sentiment, it was negative. Um, exactly. Yes, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's also, um, it's very interesting. So the way we interpret this negative coefficient on, uh, let's say, the direct effect of green sentiment is to say that we have green sentiment in particularly bad quarters. So, uh, so for when the market is, uh, is down, for instance. And this is somehow consistent also with the literature suggesting that uh, in period of crisis, there is a, a higher demand for ESG, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, uh, this does not influence our, our results. In fact, as a robustness check, we add 
months uh, or quarter fixed effect here, quarter fixed effect, which cancel, which cancel this direct effect. So they, this direct coefficient disappear, but our interaction term is still, uh, uh, still uh, positive and statistically significant. So meaning that uh, our result does, do not depend on the macroeconomic conditions. But it's interesting to see that there seems to be more green sentiment when things are going uh, bad. <laughs> So for instance, uh, one, he, could the COVID uh, crash, uh, we don't analyze the COVID crash specifically in this paper, but we know from an anecdotal evidence that there was quite a lot of green sentiment during the COVID crash, for instance. So green ETF have been doing particularly well mm -hmm. uh, during the crash. And this is consistent with these funds, with these uh, results somehow. Okay, that's, that's, really, that's really, really cool um, that you can kind of explain also those those more recent uh, developments, and we had some papers on COVID here as well in the conference. So this uh, um, quite a lot of, let's say, side stories of uh, in your paper, which are also uh, really, uh, really interesting. So any further questions? Just um, looking at the chat, there is no question there. Also not from the rest of the audience. And I'm also happy with your presentation and the discussion, uh, Stefano. Thank you so much for your Thank time you. and your presentation. Thanks, Alexander. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And um, looking forward to um, Anne Christine, who is going to present uh, our uh, last paper today um, in the direction of uh, sustainable consumers preferences and social responsible investment, um, a study using row advisors. Um, mm -hmm. Looking very much forward to that one as well, Anne Christine. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can see my slides now. First of all, thank you very much for the great opportunity to be present at the conference today. Um, I'm going to present a paper that I've worked on jointly with my co-author, Oliver Laubach. Um, we have uh, wondered whether sustainable consumers also prefer socially responsible investments. And this is already the title of our research paper. I will use the next 20 minutes to briefly uh, motivate this research question and its relevance. Uh, I will thereafter explain how we've addressed the question. Um, I will then, then present our main findings. And to conclude, I will point out how we contribute uh, to the literature. Basically, the motivation for this paper is the same as for all papers that deal with the motives of socially responsible retail investors, because we have the European Union and sustainable investments, and we have many interested retail investors that do not yet engage in sustainable investing. The most frequently reported reasons for this issue is that um, these investors feel insufficiently informed about the matter and that their current financial service provider does not offer sustainable investments yet. So we thought if we want to increase the share of individuals that invest in a sustainable manner, then we have to find a way that allows us to identify those individuals that have a genuine interest in sustainable investing, because this would allow us to uh, provide them with the information that they require and to approach them with an investment product that matches their sustainability preferences. What we already know from the literature is that social preferences in general and um, sustainability awareness drive sustainable investments among retailers. But what we need to know a little more about is how to actually identify sustainable investment preferences. Bauer et al. have already um, elicited the the investment preferences of put on their funds investment policy. What we want to do is elicit investment preferences of individuals, even if they are not our clients yet. So what we do is we investigate what their non-investment related behavior reveals about their investment preferences. And we could have looked at um, charitable giving, for instance, here, or political orientation or religious activity, for instance, but um, all of these activities are hardly observed. most of the time and the end of the day is to consume. And this is why we were pretty surprised to find out that um, the relation between sustainable consumer and investment preferences has hardly been studied so far. 
Mm, the theory on moral behavior actually allows for two possible observations in our study. Either we could see a positive relation, a spillover effect between these sustainable actions, or we could see a negative relation between sustainable consumer and investment behavior, which would be in line with the moral licensing effect, where sustainable consumer behavior relieves, guilty, uh, relieves individuals of their guilty conscience, even if they do not invest in a sustainable method. So you see, it's not clear upfront whether it's the sustainable consumers that also invest in a sustainable manner at the end of the day. So what we were interested in um, is uh, the uh, consumer preferences of investors. And if we want to study um, preferences, then we can do that in two possible ways. We can either study stated preferences or revealed preferences. Except for the paper, um, by Rieder and Smeets and Bauer et al. Most of the current research that deals with uh, the motives of socially responsible investors um, has relied on state of these uh, survey responses is that talk is often cheap when it comes to sustainable choices. And what we see as a problem with our research question in particular is that we cannot really derive from stated preferences whether individuals will behave in a consistent or inconsistent manner. So we use an approach that relies on revealed preferences and allows us to test exactly for this incongruence in behavior. What we do is we give investors the choice between a sustainable mainstream version of that consumer product with a higher monetary benefit. What we do in detail is we invite uh, investors to take part in our survey, but before they start the survey, they are given the opportunity to take part in our lottery that we carry out as appreciation for their participation in the survey. And there they can choose between four different fashion label vouchers, two sustainable and two mainstream fashion label vouchers. Uh, we, we offer a uh, two different vouchers or labels here uh, each um, in order to reduce to a certain extent the effect that personal style generally because we wanted to study a consumer choice that our participants will frequently make in their daily lives and that has both uh, a crucial environmental as well as social impact. So on the one hand, we study a real consumer choice. And on the other hand, it was important to us to study uh, real investors and their behavior. And therefore, we worked jointly with three German robo-advisors and studied their clients' behavior. Um, by the way, robo-advisors are digital wealth managers that um, manage the portfolios of their clients on an automated basis by investing into a mix of ETFs and bonds. And in doing so, they are able to provide a financial advice to a large number of clients at relatively low cost and a low required investment volume. So each of the three robot advisors that we worked well with followed a completely different investment approach. The first one, Grony, was at the time of our study at least a completely conventional robot advisor that was keen to learn about its clients' interest in sustainable investments. The second robo-advisor, Visual Vest, which I will from now on refer to as the mixed robo-advisor, because it was the first German robo-advisor to offer a completely sus um, sustainable portfolio alternative next to its conventional investment portfolios. Um, but um, the mixed robo-advisor charges higher costs for the sustainable portfolio version for its clients. And the third robo-advisor, Vividam, which I will call the sustainable robo-advisor because it is the only German robo-advisor that exclusively offers sustainable investments to its clients and charges the highest cost among the three robo-advisors for the portfolio management. So to sum up, we already knew before our participants started the survey about their uh, consumer preferences. We knew that from the lottery choice and we knew um, on the investment side, which robo-advisor they are clients of and which investment strategy this robo-advisor follows. We then used the survey responses to better understand the decisions of our, uh, our participants.
We ask them, for instance, uh, why they have become um, client of their robo-advisor in particular, be it, for instance, for um, the good past performance or for offering sustainable investments. We then asked the clients of VisualVest, the mixed robo advisor, which of the two portfolio versions they have um, they have decided for, be it the conventional vest folio or the sustainable green folio. And then we asked the clients of the uh, conventional robo advisor whether they are interested in the launch of sustainable robo advisory services with Growme. Moreover, we wanted to be able to test whether a potential effect that we find also extends to investments that go beyond robo advice, so to the entire investment portfolio. And therefore, we asked uh, the participants to indicate the estimated share of their portfolio that is invested in a sustainable manner. And then we posed a series of questions related to control variables. We asked the clients about their knowledge um, about sustainable investments, their risk and return expectations regarding sustainable investments. We included um, several questions from previous recognized studies um, that capture the attitudes and beliefs uh, of the investors regarding sustainable investments. And then we also captured the socio-demographic characteristics, risk preferences, and investment skills of these uh, individuals. And finally, we asked them to describe their consumer behavior uh, in terms of environmental and social responsibility based on a scale that was proposed by Sudbury Riley at Kohlbacher initially. Because afterwards, we wanted to compare how they describe their consumer behavior themselves and what they have decided for in the lottery, the, the sustainable or the conventional fashion voucher. I will now first present the outcome, the outcome of our lottery. What you see here is the share of participants that opted to receive a voucher from the respective category. So from the fair fashion category, the mainstream fashion category, or did not want to be considered in the lottery at all. We see this separately for each robot advisor. And what we note is that, um, among the clients of the sustainable robo-advisor, the share of participants that wanted to receive a fair fashion voucher is substantially higher than among the clients of the conventional robo-advisor. When we look at the mixed robo-advisor, um, we again see that among the clients that have the green portfolio version, the share of participants with a fair fashion voucher was substantially higher than among the clients that have a, a conventional portfolio with a robo advisor. What we see here in our descript descriptive statistics is also what we find in our regression results. So sustainable consumers prefer to invest in a sustainable manner and therefore behave consistently as consumers and investors according to our results. Mm. What I show you here are um, the marginal effects of the profit regressions uh, in column one, three, and four, and the um, relative risk ratios of marginal mere logit regression in column two. And what they show us is that if we look at the clients of the very same robo advisor, the mixed robo advisor, then we find that those who are sustainable consumers also have a significantly higher likelihood to have a sustainable portfolio with that robo advisor. Sustainable consumers are also more likely to be client of the completely sustainable robo advisor. And they are more likely to um, base the decision upon their robo advisor on the access to sustainable investments. And finally, we provide at least some indication that this and this effect extends to investments that go beyond robo advice, so to the entire investment portfolio. Mm, this positive and significant relation that we find between sustainable consumer and investment uh, decisions um, is robust to omitted variable bias and reverse causality. And the latter is particularly important because we wanted to um, establish consumption as means to identify sustainable investment preferences and not necessarily the other way around. And moreover, um, we note a strong interest in the launch of sustainable investments among the clients of the conventional robo advisor. 
21% indicate a seven on a seven point Likert scale that they will make use of sustainable investments if Grony offers them in the future. And again, this reported interest in sustainable investments was particularly strong among the sustainable consumers as this ordered pro profit regression shows us. So the first or the main finding of our research is that sustainable consumers prefer to invest in a sustainable manner. The second is, and what is what I want to talk about now is that um, revealed preferences are more credible than reported behavior when it comes to sustainable choices. And this is what already Bauer et al postulated in their uh, research, because our results show us that uh, those individuals that report to be sustainable consumers, but do not walk their talk in the lottery, so they choose a conventional um, voucher instead of the, um, or the mainstream voucher instead of the sustainable voucher, they also make very different investment decisions than the truly sustainable consumers who have chosen the sustainable voucher, even if it provides a lower monetary benefit. And therefore, we conclude that we can that little can be learned from stated preferences that are not backed up by the pertinent actions. What you see here is the very same regression as on the previous slide, but now we add a dummy for those individuals who pretend to be sustainable consumers. So they report to be sustainable consumers on that consumer scale by Sudbury, Riley and Kohlbacher, but they um, do not actually decide in favor of the sustainable fashion voucher. And what we see and what's pretty interesting is that they also report to be interested in sustainable investments, but they do not have a higher likelihood than the mainstream consumers to actually invest in a sustainable manner. So neither do they have a higher likelihood than the mainstream consumers to have a sustainable portfolio with the mixed robo-advisor, nor are they more likely to be client of the completely sustainable robo-advisor. I would now like to conclude my presentation um, by pointing out what our contribution is. We first of all, contribute to the literature that deals with um, spillover effects of moral behavior by providing um, at least some indication that individuals tend to behave in a consistently sustainable manner as both consumers and investors. Moreover, we contribute to the literature that deals with the motives of sustainable retail investors um, by studying revealed preferences. And what we do is we find a group of individuals that has previously been overlooked and that cheap talks regarding their sustainability preferences. And moreover, we provide a feature that may help to identify those who have a genuine interest in sustainable investing. Therefore, our um, results are interesting to practitioners because they may help to unlock more of the hidden potential of sustainable retail investors. And uh, as a side finding, at least, we show that there is a substantial demand for sustainable robo-advisory services. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne Christian. Uh, also, quite an interesting paper. Um, also, you, you, the approach you, you choose, I think it's quite quite good. And also, especially if you have a focus that is research on uh, what do we assume and what do we really know? And based on the paper of uh, Rock Bauer and also of uh, Paul Smeets, I think that was uh, quite a very uh, good approach. I have. Um, there are no questions in the chat so far, so I encourage mm -hmm. the other uh, um, participants as well. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, you had, if I uh, remember correctly, you had 75 for the sustainability voucher and you got 100 for the, the mainstream voucher. Yes. Um, this was, uh, of course, intentionally. Um, was the idea that you because because that might be the effect that you that you nudge the people more to to take the mainstream voucher if they get more for it so what was the the idea behind it the idea was that um the sustainable choice has to be costly at the end of the day mm -hmm. i mean it's it's also in the real life that um that sustainable products cost more in general and it's also the case with the um with the portfolio versions the sustainable um 
portfolio manager charges higher management costs for the sustainable portfolio version. So um, otherwise, if we would have offered two uh, vouchers that have the same value, then I guess um, most of the, the people would have decided in favor of the sustainable uh, voucher simply because they would like to try out uh, what it is uh, we're interested mm -hmm. in it but we really mm -hmm. wanted to to see who is willing to sacrifice because i guess this is what is the issue at the end of the day who is willing to sacrifice be it um yeah monetary value um to to, to act in a sustainable manner at the end of the day mm -hmm. yeah. and this was a real voucher or was that um so they really yeah. got this voucher okay yeah yeah, yeah we uh, come mm -hmm. to, uh, Mm -hmm. Definitely, it was really as as a thank you for their appreciation, uh, their participation. Mm -hmm. uh, they they received these. Uh, we actually had several vouchers uh, from each um, fashion label, and they could simply decide which one they wanted to receive. And we bought them afterwards and sent them to them. Okay, yeah. ah, cool. Okay, my, my second question is more for for the controls. Um, did you find any differences um, for your um, controls, like male, female, education background? Anything that helps explaining the uh, the behavior a bit? Mm -hmm. Um, actually, not not that much as I would have expected. Um, it was not that uh, the the women uh, were significantly more likely to to be sustainable investors and consumers. In, it was interesting to find that um, women seem to be um, want to be at least sustainable in one of the two. Um, there was a significant effect. Um, but when we controlled for, for instance, social preferences or, or this, this voucher choice, then there was no significant effect for women, for instance. We also had um, education, highly, uh, so like people uh, that have an, uh, a university background, they were also more likely to, to do the one or the other at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Did you also ask, refrain. I mean, this, yeah, I mean, and there's a, a very popular and often significant control is uh, children um, or grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Did you control for the, this one shaped by their daughter? Um, no, no. control for that? <laughs> no, we haven't controlled for that. We have control for, for age, for gender, for, for the um, financial background, like uh, what, what's the monthly net income, um, mm -hmm. education, it's job, uh, but we, we didn't control for, uh, for children. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there was there was this the, the second part. I'm not quite sure if I got that correctly. Maybe you can just um, mm -hmm. share your slides again. Um, yeah. That was um, yeah mm -hmm. something I was yeah thanks a lot. I think it was one of the the last slides of the second part of your paper. Um, yeah. One slide back, mm -hmm. I think. One more, uh, yeah, that one, uh, exactly. So maybe you can just just explain that again. I wasn't quite sure if, if I got yeah, that sure. correctly. Um, that would be great, sorry mm -hmm. for that. No worries, no worries. Uh, it was quite a lot of information in a very short amount of time. So it was basically the same regression as this one. We have this um, reported interest by um, the clients of the conventional robot advisor, um, whether they uh, uh, think they will or how likely is it that they will make use of uh, sustainable investments if they are in the end offered to them. And we first of all control for those uh, who um, opted to receive that fair fashion name voucher those are the sustainable consumer uh, consumers in the first row and then we controlled for that group that um, described in the last part of the survey described themselves as being sustainable consumers so they they um, reported something like um, I, I always pay attention to sustainability when going to the supermarket but they, uh, in the lottery, they opted for the convention of fashion voucher. And it was quite interesting because it seems so similar, the reported interest um, to these truly sustainable consumers. But when we go one slide further, we see that these, um, these pretending sustainable consumers do not invest in sustainable portfolios when they are given the choice, for instance, with the mixed robot advisor or when they have the choice to be client of the sustainable robot advisor. And I thought it was quite interesting that maybe this, this cheat talk 
seems to extend to other areas of decision making as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I mean, this is really, really nice. Did you find any differences there between your controls? So um, is it more the, the male that is cheating? Uh, that's actually quite interesting. I should I should look at that. Uh, I, I obviously I only looked at the investment and consumer relation, mm -hmm. but that was would be mm -hmm. quite interesting. I'll check that afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think uh, that would be quite interesting. Sorry, okay. male in, in the those uh, mm -hmm. who are in, in the meeting right now. So it's um, yeah, but it might be quite interesting. interesting no, it, it's assumption is it the male or the female? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, sorry, I said I said male before. I shouldn't do that. So therefore, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we just we just leave it okay, open to male, you. Okay, okay. I'll check and tell you after. All right. Words. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Any any okay. further question? Let me just check if there is anything in the chat. There there isn't. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, and Christian, thank you so much for your presentation as well. Um, thank you for and, the moderation. Uh, yeah, thank you to all the other um, two presenters. I think it was a very uh, interesting session. It's always difficult for those presenting being at the end of the conference, but uh, you did an excellent job. So thank you for that. And I would just uh, encourage you to also participate in the rest of the conference because we will now have uh, the closing keynote. And very importantly for all of you, we will have the paper prize ceremony um, at... Um, 4.30 London or uh, um, 9.30 Beijing time, um, the prize ceremony, and then some closing notes um, also regarding the next uh, Grassley conference in 2020. Falco will present, so this is an indication that it might be in Zurich. It will be in Zurich, of course. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. Um, looking forward to seeing you later for the prize award. And of course, next year in Zurich and hopefully face-to-face -face and um, very excellent presentation. So enjoy the weekend and uh, see you later. Bye. Thank you, you too. Bye.